Good evening and welcome to the Songers Center here at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. It's great to have you here. This is part of our speaker series that we're sponsoring here at the university. One of the reasons we wanted to have this Songers Center was to make it a student convocation center where we had events just like this and we are delighted to have author Stephen King here this evening. But th think about it, for 35 years Stephen King has been at the top of his profession. What a tremendous career and he's here tonight. 50 books, 350 million copies printed. 50 of his works have become either movies or television programs. He is clearly one of the incredible literary giants of our time and we're delighted to have him here. An amazing thing about him being here tonight is he has decided and his wife Tabitha have decided that he is not going to accept any money tonight and he's going to donate 100% of his fee to scholarships for UMass Lowell students. So that means 100% of the proceeds for tonight are going to go to scholarships for students in our English department. And I have to tell you, We have a fabulous English department at UMass Law, led by Tony Seschel. I don't, where is Tony? Right here. They're a fabulous department with outstanding faculty, and they have been on a roll this year. Uh, we celebrated a collaboration with the uh, National Park here in Lowell, uh, Dickens and Lowell, which is a celebration of Charles Dickens' uh, 200th a birthday, but also his visit to the city of Lowell in 1842. It was a great event. And then we also collaborated with the Merrimack Repertory Theater uh, because Jack Kerouac is from Lowell and uh, his, his only play, full play that he wrote was a collaboration with our English department, Beat Generation, and that got worldwide attention. And that's our English department. And they are co-sponsors of tonight's event as well. And again, all the proceeds go to the English department. Now, these are two very nice chairs. I like, to, I like to mark it. Now, Stephen King is going to sign both of these chairs, and there's an auction. May, many of you may have seen it. It's $10 a ticket, and 100% of the proceeds will go to scholarships for our students who are English majors. So I would urge any of you they're all going to be on sale in the concourse throughout uh, this event. So if you haven't bought one or you want to up your chances of winning, feel free to buy a, a raffle for this. Uh, I'm going to call, actually, uh, we're going to, we call this uh, a conversation with, I also, by the way, want to thank our sponsors tonight. They have all contributed to make this event a success. And thank you to all of the sponsors. We call this a conversation with Stephen King, and that conversation is going to be held uh, with one of our fabulous, fabulous faculty members in the English department, Andre Debuse III. Now, I would never call somebody my favorite faculty member, however, um, he is a, a fabulous author. He's already written uh, five books. Um, uh, two of them, the New York Times bestseller. In fact, the book Townie, if you haven't read it yet, it's on sale tonight, and it, Andre didn't ask me to do this, but it's on sale tonight. It's a fabulous book, it's a memoir, and any of you who have grown up either in the Merrimack Valley or in any urban area anywhere in the world, this is a fabulous read and I would encourage you to read it. But we are so pleased to have Andre Debus III on our faculty. He grew up in the Merrimack Valley. He identifies with students. He's a fabulous uh, faculty member. And Andre is going to be uh, sort of having this conversation with Stephen King. Please welcome Andre Debus III and Stephen King.
Shameless Camaro. Shameless Camaro. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? You know what? I think we ought to stop right here. This is the high point. This of is evening. it, brother. And good night. <laughs> so uh, nice, nice to see you all. Glad you came out to our little soiree. It's scary as shit to see so many people. <laughs> this, is, it is this is my first stadium show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his first stadium show. So here's what I want to do. Uh, we're going to kind of divide the night up into three parts. Mr. King and I are going to shoot the breeze for about half an hour about various subjects. And then we have a real special treat. He's going to debut a brand new short story that no one's heard, laid eyes on, or read tonight. <laughs> its world premiere is right here at the Strongest Arena. Andre thinks it's special because he hasn't read it. Yeah. <laughs> well. And so, and then after he reads, we're going to turn it over to you guys and do some, uh, just a conversation Q&A with Mr. King. Um, let me just jump in for a second on a little intro about my when friend. When did here. I become Mr. King to you? All right, well, I'm, I call him Stevie. He calls me Andre Dubas. So I'll call, we'll do that. Uh, look, it's- You can it's, call it's, me anything you want as long as the check doesn't bounce. You know what I'm saying? Did Marty mention that, by the way? Okay. Look, uh, the truth is, this man needs no introduction. But I do want to say just a couple of things about, about Steve. Never mind the 350 million books sold worldwide. <laughs> by the way, you probably don't know that you've outsold Charles Dickens times two. It's incredible. Um, he didn't have e-books. Never mind, yeah, e-books. <laughs> never mind the 50-some-odd film adapt adaptations. <laughs> Some of which were good. <laughs> never mind his wicked good American Express commercial. We'll talk about that. You're dating yourself. I now, am. I am dating myself. Andre. And also, Steve's won dozens and dozens of prestigious awards, including the National Book Foundation's Distinguished uh, Honor for American Letters, Contribution to American Letters. And there's another award that a lot of people don't know about that I, I think is, is really germane here. Poets and Writers Magazine gave him the Writers for Writers Award. Because the man is really generous with writers who will never have his readership or even a fraction of it. And I just, I want to tell a quick story and then we're going to start. We met 25 years ago. Do you believe that? 25 years ago, I was two. <laughs> he was six. If, a lot of you may know that my father was the great short story writer, Andre de We were younger was, and hornier in those days. Yeah, that's right. We were. Hey, speak for yourself. <laughs> Bada bing. <laughs> We'll be here all week, folks, really. My father, uh, my father was run over and, and crippled in a, in a car accident in 1986. And Steve King, John Irving, E.L. Doctorow, about six or seven other real prominent writers um, chipped in their talents to raise money for my father's astronomical medical bills he couldn't pay. And so the first time I met Steve was in 1987 at the Charles Hotel uh, when he was reading from a story that I still remember about a woman who is cleaning the closet and accidentally shoots herself and doesn't realize it till the end of the day. Revelations yeah. of Becca Pulse and later became a part of a book called The Tommy Knockers. Oh, the yeah. the Tommy Knockers! <laughs> so I, I, we're going to get to it, but uh, truly what I love about this man even more than his profound work and contribution to American Letters is He's a good man, and he's a giving man, and he's a generous man, and it shows by Jesus, you're making me sound like I died. You ain't dead yet. So, it's generosity. <laughs> now, 
I'm going to throw out a few softballs, and he's just going to wink. He's going to hit them. I need my glasses, though. Hold on. Steve, tell the joke while I'm looking for my glasses. Okay, you're looking for your glasses? Yeah, I'm looking for my glasses. All okay. right. I'm going to read a, a quote from... Uh, by the way, for all of you writers out there, if you have not read Stephen's uh, On Writing, a memoir of the craft, you must. It's a beautiful book. This is like Steve King's greatest hits. <laughs> oh, wait, Play you... Free Bird. <laughs> light, your, light your lighters later. You know, I don't know what these questions are, and if we, I don't we know have the not answer, rehearsed. I'm just going to say, fuck yeah, you know? <laughs> okay, well, in, the, in the green room, we just told dirty jokes. So here we go. You told dirty jokes. <clears throat> yeah, but you laughed. I talked about <laughs> literature. <laughs> All right, okay. I'm going to get serious now. He says they're going to be softball questions, so. Here we go. This is a quote from On Writing, and I love it for very many reasons. Primarily because not enough writers talk about it in this way. Talk about the, the, the craft of writing. Stories are found relics, part of an undiscovered pre-existing world, Stephen King says. He also says he's against plotting and the spont because plotting and the spontaneity of real creation are not compatible. Expound, sir. <laughs> it's like taking the SATs. I think, myself, that, you know, I don't start with a story that's... Uh, I was telling a writing class today that the... Uh, kind of the scariest thing I ever heard, I was doing a writing thing with John Irving, who put that thing together for your dad, by the way, and it, it's worth mentioning that when Andre's dad was hurt, he had stopped to help another pedestrian. And that's how that happened. Um, but in any case, John Irving, when he was talking to a bunch of would-be writers one time, said that the first thing he does with a book is write the last line of that book. And I heard that, and I just went, you know, like that. Because to me, that's kind of like spoiling the fun. I like to start with a little bit of an idea. You know, uh, they come from different places. Sometimes they stick around and you want to do something, sometimes they don't. But the idea is to start with something and just start to go with it, you know. And uh, that's the joy of finding things out, of having characters that just sort of walk on and become a big part of the story. When I wrote The Green Mile, I had no idea where it was yeah. going. Thank you, thank you. I, I had no idea where that was going. I started with an idea about a, a guy uh, who was in prison and he was the snack guy who went around, he was a trustee and he went around with a snack wagon and he had a little tame mouse that uh, rode on the, on the cart. And of course, the mouse m made it into the story but the rest of it didn't. But little by little it just sort of built itself up, and the way that the pieces came together at the end was terrific. I like that. But how did the guy in pushing the cart down the prison hallway come to you? It just came and it, staring That at was the where it started, and th those are the sort of the mysterious parts of it. Sometimes there's no way to say where things come from. I know that uh, back around 1976 or 1977, I had a Honda 500 motorcycle and it started to miss and uh, jerk, and, and uh, I didn't really know how to fix it. I messed around with it a little bit, and this guy said, um, well, there's a fellow about seven miles up out in the woods who's really good with small engines, and he's got this unique way of doing business. He says what a thing's going to cost, and that, that's what it ends up costing you. So I thought that was a good idea, so I got on my motorcycle <laughs> and I drove out there to this guy's farm, and it really was out in East Jupipi. So I got out there, and there was a little tiny farmhouse, and there was this big barn, and I could hear him inside working with stuff. I got into the dooryard, and the motorcycle died on me. And out of this barn 
became the biggest goddamn St. Bernard dog you ever saw in your life. And he started to walk toward me, and I hear, <laughs> and you know their eyes are sort of pussy. Have you ever noticed that about St. Bernard's, particularly when it's warm, they kind of get this gluck coming out of them. And the guy who ran the place came out, he was wearing overalls, and he had an, he had an adjustable socket wrench on a, you know, on a ball thing. And he said, oh, that's Buster. He does that to everyone, but he loves people. He won't hurt you. <laughs> so I reached down, which you should never do to a dog, to Buster, to show him what a good guy I was. And, <laughs> and Buster just went down on his haunches. I mean, this was, dog was 150, 160 pounds. He just went down, and he started to come up. And that guy brought that socket wrench down on him. It was like an, a rug beater hitting a rug. And the dog just shrank down, and there wasn't a word of apology. He just said, Buster must not like your looks. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't like his looks very much either. But that kind of stuck in my mind, and I thought to myself, well, I was on my motorcycle and unprotected, but what if, because it's always a what if, that's kind of like the magic thing. What if the guy hadn't been here, and what if I was in a little car that stopped and it was hot? And that was sort of the genesis for Cujo. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> and actually, John Irving, I think, is, is unusual in, in I, don't, I don't think a lot of novelists outline their stories. He's very smart and, and good at it. but. Uh, so you begin with the situation first and characters second. The characters come as you're exploring the situation that's fueled by the question, what if? Yeah, I mean, I could say about Cujo, uh, okay, we're talking about a, a woman. Finally, I decided it was going to be a woman uh, who wants to protect her son. And then little by little, that character starts to develop like an old-fashioned film play in developing fluid. So you say to yourself, well, okay, this is how old she is, this is what her background is, this is what she does, she's cheating on her husband, that's another fact. And a lot of the things just sort of come together, work together, and you let them. That's the thing. You don't try to manage these people or push them around, you just sort of let them be what they're going to be. It's good. It's a great job. This is wonderful, you know. I mean, I make all these things up, and you know, people who do that, like, go to psychiatrists, <laughs> and they pay like 70 bucks an hour, and it's not a full hour, it's like 50 minutes. <laughs> I make all this shit up, and people pay me. <laughs> it's great, you know? Thank you. All right, so you guys put my kids through college, and I scared the shit out of you while I was doing it. It's <laughs> terrific. It's a win-win. <laughs> All right, Pete, uh, speaking of people paying you, so I told Steve, I'd get, I did give him a little hint about what I might be doing. So I'm going to ask a few craft questions, and I'm going to ask a few glitzy fame and fortune business questions. And I'm going to ask the big one up front about the fact is, it is really rare for a writer to be as recognizable as this man is. Maybe since Hemingway's days, Hemingway was a really recognizable writer. But I have to give you a st quick story from a few years ago about how famous this guy is. <laughs> so we did this, remember that thing we did at the 4 or 6 Club uh, at Fenway Park? Right. And it was about baseball writing, and Updike was there, and Doris Kern, it's a good wood, and it was a lovely night. Anyway. The next day, this big poor thunderstorm. guy... Big You remember there was a big... That? Wasn't there a big thunderstorm that night? Yeah, it was raining. Yeah. And um, why are you asking? I just making conversation, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Steve, it was raining wicked hot. So what? <laughs> so anyway, the next big day, thunderstorm. It was scary. It was like the end of the world. The next day, the poor man's just walking across the street to get a cup of coffee. The Ver a Verizon truck drives by, and the driver of the Verizon truck yells. Yo, Stevie! Cujo! Yeah! <laughs> That's Boston. I mean, that, that kind of thing does happen from time to time in Boston, you know. It's really funny. All right, so look. Everybody everybody the... Oh, John Coffey! You rock! <laughs> but 
But that does not happen to any other writer. Maybe J.K. Rowling now, but they wouldn't be that. They wouldn't say, yo, J.K., love you, baby. Won't happen. My, my favorite story is like uh, oh, probably maybe 25 years ago when my hair was actually dark and I had a, I had a black beard. I had a big black beard. And uh, I was not, I was a writer. I mean, we're supposed to be the secret agents of the arts, okay? We cruise around and see what you guys are doing and end up putting it in books. So this is a, a strange situation for me. So about 25 years ago, when I really was kind of a secret agent, I'd published maybe six or seven books, but you know, it wasn't a big deal. And I went in Nathan's, the hot dog place in New York, and I got up to the counter, I sat down on the stool, and I, I ordered a, a foot long, you know, and a, you know, one of those uh, orange drinks or something. And I'm sipping my drink, and I'm waiting for my hot dog. And I look through the pass-through into the kitchen, and the cook's looking at me, and he sees me looking at him, and he's right away, he's cooking again, cooking again. <laughs> so I, I go back, I'm, I'm reading my book, I read just about everywhere, and I'm reading my book, and I look up. Oh, he, he's down there. <laughs> So finally he comes out, and I'm thinking to myself, now remember, I had the big beard and I had on uh, the dark 70s type glasses. It's embarrassing now, but that's the way we rolled back then. That's all there is to it. So, <laughs> so he walks out, and I think to myself, this guy recognized me. He knows who I am. He walks up to me, he goes, are you somebody famous? <laughs> and I say, well, a little bit. <laughs> he says, you know, like you do something artistic, right? I go, well, not all critics agree, but <laughs> I like to think so. He says, you're Francis Ford Coppola, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Yes, I am. <laughs> because everybody who does this, you, me, everybody else who does this, we're fucking liars. You know, how do you know we're lying, our mouths are moving? So he asked me for an autograph and I gave him one. <laughs> and, and did I regret that? The hell I did, I thought it was great. But the other thing is people do this cross check thing in their brains and they'll come up to me and say, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and I'll say, yes. But I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you one story, and, Please, and then no. we'll get back to this, because I love this. I knew a guy named Dave Marsh, because he used to be in the critics' chorus in this group called the Rock Bottom Remainders, where I play a little <laughs> rhythm guitar. And one day, this goes back quite a ways, you know, like 20 years, and he says to me, uh, Bruce Springsteen would like to meet you. Would you like to have dinner with Bruce Springsteen? And I said, oh, yes, that would be nice. <laughs> so we did. We, we went to this little cafe down in the village, and it was, you know, a bar in front and tables in the back. And we were sitting, and he's a really nice guy, and, and we were having, uh, uh, you know, corned beef and cabbage sandwiches or whatever, or, and beer, because I was still drinking in those days. And uh, so... This party came in. There was a husband and a wife and their daughter who was about 16 years old. And all you had to do was to look at her and know it was a special day for her. Probably her birthday, maybe her parents were taking her out for that. But she had on this white blouse and a, a necklace, a gold necklace, and this nice skirt that was multicolored. And she was wearing her best shoes and everything and her hair was done and they're sitting in there eating and all this other stuff and then she looks over like that and it, she just like flipped you know i mean it wasn't like she ah screamed or anything like that but she got up and she walked to our table and it was like her feet didn't touch the floor she was like a sleepwalker dreamwalker something this beautiful 16 year old <laughs> girl and I could see Bruce getting his pen out of his pocket. She never fucking looked at him. Yeah! <laughs> Cut it out! Yeah! She said, 
Are you Stephen King? I've read almost all your books. I'd die for your autograph. So. <laughs> and that, that was the apex of it. You know what? What's so great about that story is I think, I think so many writers want to be rock and roll stars, man. So that's so sweet. Yeah, all right, well, look, I gotta, and it, look, if it's too personal and tell me to shut up, I know you will. But there's got to be a downside to not be able to walk across the street without the Verizon truck guy yelling at you. The first time that I ever gave an autograph, you know, you do this thing where, and some of you heard this story before, but I, I never get tired of telling it because it's like a trauma. It's like one of those basic traumas of your life. I'm going to make it real short. I did a tour. It was the first book tour. It was for The Shining. And I did it with Kitty Kelly, who wrote, at that time she had a book about Frank Sinatra. Uh, my mother used to call him Frankie the Snot, but that's beside the point. <laughs> and, and Jersey Kosinski was with us too. So we did this tour and we ended up in a lot of cities. And the last one was Pittsburgh. And in those days, you did this thing where you did all the media that you could and the local paper put on a dinner at night and there's pictures and all that other stuff. And this thing was way up in this fancy restaurant on what they call the Incline in, in Pittsburgh. And I got sick. I mean, I really got sick. It was Montezuma's Revenge, and I don't want to get all uh, clinical about it, but I'll just say that I rushed to the bathroom, and the bathroom was Babylonian. I mean, it was this huge thing and everything, and there was an attendant, and the only thing was the stalls didn't have doors. You just said, but I was beyond caring about that, you know. <laughs> I went in there and everything came out that could possibly come out. This and is just between us now. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm getting to the point. So, I mean, this wave of depression came over me because I wasn't used to being away. I missed my wife, I missed my kids. Uh, the whole thing about the morning TV and everything. I just wanted to get home. And I'm thinking to myself, things can't get any worse. And I see the bathroom attendant. 116 years old, advancing on me with a pad and a pen. <laughs> and he says, I think I saw you on AM Pittsburgh. Can I have your autograph? <laughs> and it's the only one I ever gave in the shithouse. <laughs> so that's the downside. That okay? is the downside. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'm going to go back to a, a substantial craft question. You've spoken a lot about uh, your novels come together through two previously unrelated ideas. They come together and they make something new under the sun. You go on to say your job isn't to find these ideas, but recognize them when they show up. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you might want to give a concrete example, maybe with your first novel. You mean, you, we're talking about Carrie yeah. here? Yeah, the two of it. The well, two. yeah! Yeah, you too. <laughs> Isn't this an amazing crowd? Give yourselves a hand while I think about that. Uh, as a student, I knew a couple of girls uh, who were at the very bottom of the social pecking order. You know, high school is probably the most savage social caste system that America has. You know, it's very divided and popularity becomes very important and it's very difficult for adolescents because they're not emotionally grounded yet and these girls were the absolute bottom and uh, one of them later committed suicide but I had a chance to watch that ostrac you know that ostracism in, in progress and then later as a teacher I saw the same thing from the other side of the desk and uh, those two things came together for me along with a number of articles that I'd seen about the possibility that psychokinetic phenomena, if it existed, probably existed in teenagers and probably existed in disturbed teenage girls. And I thought this would make a terrific book, so I wrote it. I threw it away, and my wife picked it out of the trash. Um, Thank God. And she's never let me forget it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, look, man, this, you got to tell the story about, if you have not read uh, On Writing, what, what, it's, it's really a really a wonderful book in many ways, but the first half's a little memoir uh, of Stephen's start in the world. And like a lot of people, he started out with nothing. 
single mom, a brother, and him living in real, real, real deep first world poverty. And one of the, one of the things I love about your book is it's also a lovely homage to you and your wife. And 40 years together, that's not, it's no small thing. But we, got, we actually have to pretty soon move, move to your reading, which is going to be great. I just, would you mind telling them that great story of when you got the call from your paperback editor <laughs> and, your, and the, in the place you were living and how you were living and where you were working? It's a they, great story. They tore our, uh, our apartment down last year, and I got a picture of the empty lot, and it was, it was really sort of great because that place was a real shithole. It was awful. <laughs> It was 22 Sanford Street in Bangor, Maine, and we were at the bottom. We had a couple of kids. Uh, we had absolutely no money whatsoever, and uh, we didn't have a, a, really anything to speak of. The cupboards were pretty well empty, and, and uh, my wife had taken our old car that needed a new transmission that day. It was a Sunday, and she'd gone up to Old Town to see her parents. And uh, I got a call <laughs> from Bill Thompson, who edited my first books. And coincidentally, he was also the guy who discovered John Grisham with a book called A Time to Kill. So Bill called me on the phone. I was in the house by myself, the apartment. <clears throat> and uh, I was standing in the doorway between our crappy kitchen and our even crappier dining room, and he said, he said, we sold the paperback rights to carry. I'd gotten an advance, but it was for $2,500, and they're gone to fix the car and, and to buy diapers and things like that. And I said, oh, my God, you sold the paperback? How much did you sell it for? And he said, $250,000. <laughs> no, no, that wasn't it, because it was a 50-50 split. He said, we sold it for $400,000. I got two hundred, dollars And I... I couldn't believe it, and I said, Bill, did you say $40,000? <laughs> and he said, no, we sold your paperback for $400,000, and I'm in this crappy little apartment in Bangor, Maine, with two pairs of jeans and really not much else, and all the strength went out of my legs, and I just sort of accordioned down until I was sitting on the floor, and we talked about it for a while, and I finally got it through my head, and the thought that came to my mind was, I must buy a present for my wife, who fished this book out of the trash. <laughs> and I have to get her something. And I went out, and it was Sunday. And this was, you have to realize that this was in the old days when malls were largely, like, not there. It was just downtown Bangor. And the only place that was open was the Rexall station. The, the Rexall <laughs> drugstore, so I bought her a hair dryer. <laughs> a hair dryer. Oh, Lord. So, look, we're going to get to uh, this world debut of this new story, but I'm going to read, if you don't mind, I'm going to read you two paragraphs from your book, Stephen. You wrote okay. it. And I'm going to read it to you. Hit me. And I'm actually reading this to you all because I think it says something beautiful about this man and his view of what he does that has enriched us all and will, will last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, you may know or may not know that Stephen was in a horrible car accident, not car accident, some idiot ran him over in 1999 and he almost died. And he can tell you that story if he wants, but you have to have the context because in this brief passage I want to read to you before he reads us the new story, uh, he's coming back from a real painful convalescence from this horrible accident. On some days, that writing is a pretty grim slog. On others, more and more of them, as my leg begins to heal and my mind reaccustoms itself to its old routine, I feel that buzz of happiness, that sense of having found the right words and put them in a line. It's like lifting off in an airplane. You're on the ground, on the ground, on the ground, and then you're up, riding on a magical cushion of air and prints of all you survey. That makes me happy because it's what I was made to do. Writing isn't about making money, getting famous, getting dates, getting laid, or making friends. In the end, it's about enriching the lives of those who will read your work and enriching your own life as well. It's about getting up, getting well, and getting over. Getting happy, okay? Getting happy. 
Writing is magic, as much the water of life as any other creative art. The water is free, so drink. Drink and be filled up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, man.